thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so today uh, I'm going to present this uh, 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 research that I've done in collaboration with my colleague, Davide uh, Vizentin, University of Ferrara. And he can't be here today, so um, I, will, uh, I will speak in um, his behalf. Um, the, uh, the project that we were carrying out focuses on Mesolithic sites in the Alps. Um, the end uh, of the last ice age um, uh, relieved uh, the high altitudes and the whole Alpine arc from like a really thick um, uh, depth of, eight of ice and uh, uh, doing that between the end of the Pleistocene and the beginning of the Holocene you see a reoccupation of the eye of the high altitude, so we are between the end of the Paleolithic and the beginning of the Mesolithic period. So this is the data set we have uh, for for the Alpine Arc. It's not only Mesolithic, this is erroneous, it's uh, Mesolithic and Paleolithic sites. But you can easily see that in the northeast of Italy there is uh, a clear like a cluster of, uh, of sites, especially at high altitude. And uh, researchers uh, wonder whether this cluster depend on the intensity of, research, of the research on the fact that there were more Mesolithic hunter gatherers at high altitudes in, uh, in this region. The problem with the research at high altitudes is that it's uh, largely, and everybody acknowledges that, that it's largely biased by the surface visibility first and by the morphology of, uh, of, um, of the high altitude, of the uplands. So uh, over the years, over the decades, uh, um, archaeologists and amateur archaeologists have developed kind of a, a, a research strategy and have identified some um, recurrent location patterns for uh, Mesolithic sites. When I talk about Mesolithic sites, I um, combine uh, the so-called base camps at high altitude and hunting stands because we struggle to identify them from surface finds most of the times. So these recurring patterns are, for instance, uh, in saddles, so passes like this, and around um, lakes, small um, natural lakes. So the question is, though, are these patterns um, related to the actual strategies, uh, locational strategy and mobility strategies of uh, um, Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, or are they related to the service strategies of the archaeologists on the one side and on the surface visibility on the other side? A lot of a lot of research has been done on that. So some uh, researchers have argued that no. There is a de direct dependence on the distribution of the sites from the, um, the hunting strategies and they proved that they assessed it using ethnographic evidence. Other researchers using GIS approaches have argued the opposite. So, so here this is a classic, well the visibility is not great, but so this is a classic uh, survey area of the archaeology and you can see that the archaeology is surveying this area and not here because here there is a surface erosion, so the visibility is higher. So we were wondering whether um, these two factors, or which of these two factors was the most uh, influential for understanding the distribution of the site. So uh, we took this sample of, uh, of sites. We are in, uh, in this region, this is uh, um, um, Trentino and Tradige region, not far from Austria. And this area was uh, uh, selected because it was uniformly covered by myself and by my colleagues during like a three year project funded by uh, a local institution. Um, a project focused on the uh, investigation of, uh, uh, of the landscape of, landscapes of the Dolomites, uh, specifically in this area. So the first thing we did was uh, um, delimiting a region of interest. The region of interest is, has this funny shape because we selected only the areas that were uniformly and intensively uh, surveyed in order to avoid biases. And this is the distribution of the sites. It's evident that there is a pattern, but we were wondering what are the 
the factors that influence this spatial pattern. Um, in order to do that, we incorporated the, uh, some uh, um, the different proxies, uh, potential proxies like lithology, land use, paths and roads that are vector files provided by the region with the DTM into our GRASS uh, uh, GIS projects. Uh, we used GRASS GIS to um, develop the raster maps that were uh, subsequently used uh, uh, for uh, uh, implement, um, imported into R um, for uh, the point pattern analysis that I'm going uh, to describe now. Um, so the rationale of the research is the, is the following. So we identified proxies that I'm going to describe now that might um, be related to the mo mobility and settlement strategies of Mesolithic Antigades. And we identified other, another set of proxies that are potentially related to the uh, archaeological visibility and to the constraints in, uh, in field walking. And basically we compare the two models against the uh, location of the vector data using point pattern analysis. Now, this is the funny part though. As you can see here, this is, <laughs> this is my re the repository where you can find all the R codes and I've also uploaded a text file with all the uh, grass um, code that, I've used, uh, that we used to, to create uh, the maps. For this um, conference, um, I went through the code both the R code and grass code. This is like a two and a half years uh, project. I went through the code. I changed some parameters in the installation in particular. We had access to a more uh, detailed uh, lithology, vector lithology map that in the meanwhile was released by the regional authorities and so on and so forth. Um, in a nutshell, the final results of this updated model are different from the model that we published in 2015, which is really funny. Although the results are slightly different, but the implications of these results are not. So at least from that point of view, there is some consistency. So in the repository, you find also uh, the uh, title of the paper that we published in Archaeology of Calcutta last year. So if you want to have a look uh, on uh, the rationale behind the selection of the proxies, and uh, the methods that we used. Uh, in, um, in general, I want to go through uh, the point process uh, um, modeling approach that uh, we used to analyze, uh, to analyze uh, the relationship between um, landscape, uh, landscape <coughs> covariates and uh, the distribution of our sites. Basically, uh, point pro process modeling analyzes uh, is, a, is a method to analyze the clustering, so the density or the intensity of a point process that uh, is uh, uh, assumed to be to follow a Poisson distribution against uh, uh, these models that are like uh, in, um, groups of covariates that describe an inhomogeneous Poisson distribution. So if the non-homogeneous Poisson distribution uh, reflects the or explains the intensity of the of the distribution of our points. It means that uh, the underlying process uh, simulated by uh, the model that we designed uh, is the main or affects partially uh, one of the main reasons why the the sites are distributed that way. This is like in general how it works. If you want to tell about, about the methodology or insight on how we used it and how we calibrated for, for instance, edge effects and stuff like that, we can have a chat later. Okay, so these are the three proxies we identified for uh, as uh, a proxies of, uh, to create a model for the research, archeological research biases. We, we thought that the first, uh, proxy, the first uh, bias, positive bias in this case, is the erosion. Archaeology is more likely to find archaeological sites um, on the surface, considering that the full cover of the area, the whole area is covered in, uh, in um, um, 
in a thick um, topsoil and grassy topsoil, so the visibility is overall very low. So archaeologists rely on erosions. Erosions, the, the erosions we can map are basically uh, the erosions around streams, around, channel, around channels, and the erosions uh, uh, that corresponds to uh, pathways, but not roads, for instance. Um, the, on the other side, there are other factors, like the construction of roads or buildings that uh, completely hide the, the surface visibility, so we created these, uh, uh, as well as, the, of course, the grass cover, and we created this binary map. One is good visibility, basically eroded area, zero is uh, known visibility. Land use, well, this is like a slightly simplified. Basically, it's uh, grass is an intermediate visibility, because you can get some erosions on the one side, and you can see something under like the topsoil. Woods is bad visibility, same as uh, industrial structures and so on. And uh, um, the, sorry, uh, is intermediate visibility and uh, uh, bare rocks are um, uh, null visibility. Uh, lithology, uh, we, th that's, that's the main reason why the, the model we published and this model uh, th that I'm presenting now are slightly different because uh, the lithological map that we had access to was quite coarse, not uh, very accurate. But basically, it describes both the ones we used for the previous uh, uh, iteration and this one. It describes uh, uh, um, deposits that are dated to the, certainly to the Pleistocene period, certainly to the Holocene period, or deposits that might be dated to the intermediate period. So we have like deposits that are, that are um, uh, younger than the Mesolithic sites, possibly younger than the Mesolithic sites, which means that they've covered the, the possible Mesolithic sites, and deposits are definitely earlier than Mesolithic sites. This map is more, as I said, as a higher resolution than the map that we used before. To analyze, I didn't point it that out before, to analyze the relationship between the variables, we used uh, um, uh, um, archaic uh, information criterion and the Bayesian version of the archaic information criterion. So basically it's a, a multi-model or a variable selection or stepwise variable selection in this case. So basically we, uh, we run the model with all the variables and then we run the model with two variables, with one variables, with two, vi two combination, different combinations of two variables and we saw what was the lowest, we, we checked what was the lowest uh, uh, criterion, and the lowest criterion corresponds to the, um, uh, to, the, to the best performance. And the best performance is the, um, um, is the one of the model with erosion and land use. So the model discards a lithology. Um, this is a regression-based approach. Therefore, we have some coefficients that we can look at. And uh, as you can see, these are the two coefficients with uh, a significant z, a significant p-value. Therefore, we can be confident that uh, these two factors influence the uh, visibility of archaeological sites. On the other side, we have the um, Mesolithic settlement. Uh, locational strategy uh, uh, proxies. Uh, it's really difficult to identify proxies for Mesolithic um, settlement patterns, especially proxies that are, uh, can be mapped in a reliable way. We selected eleva elevation as a proxy for vegetation and uh, animal mobility. Slope, of course we are in a mountainous environment so slope is a key factor. Insulation time, and again, insulation time is another um, parameter that we changed from the previous model to the new one. And an aspect. Aspect is a proxy of main winds of the area. <coughs> and the, the, uh, both the archaic information criterion and Bayesian information criterion drop aspect as a as reliable um, explanatory variable. And uh, it retains the other two. And they are all um, they are all significant, statistically significant, 
but slope is uh, a little bit more significant than the other two, and this is a thing that will um, that I will come back to. Then we decided to combine the two variables. So so far we see that uh, both these models, okay, the bi archaeological bias model and uh, the um, settlement strategy model, model, let's say, they both explain a bit of the um, variability in the distribution of our sites, and we decided to combine them. If we combine them, oh sorry, we combine them, and this is the result of the uh, of the multi-model stepwise selection. Uh, Archaic information criterion retains the two covariates of the first model and the three covariates of the second model, whereas the Bayesian information criterion that is more um, uh, that is more conservative, okay, and parsimonious, retains only erosion, land use, and slope. And again, as you can see, slope has a really, really strong p-value. On top of that, we added an additional covariate that I will explain why we added it at this, uh, this point, only at this point, which is distant from paths. It's not the same as the erosion map that I presented before. This is the diff distant from paths, including the main path that paths that nowadays are uh, road, like tarmac roads. So, um, we, we realized that uh, Model 4, we run the same uh, um, AC, uh, AIC and VIC, and we realized that uh, uh, the, the AIC deviates uh, uh, significantly from VIC, but, for instance, uh, these two parameters in the AIC are not significant, these are poorly, this is poorly significant, whereas these four, are all very significant, and again, slope is, is really strong again. In order to, so this was the stepwise selection of the covariates. In order to compare the, the models, we ran multi model um, comparison. So it's another way of uh, using AIC and BAC. So basically, we took the three models and we compared the performance using the AIC and BIC weights. And as you can see, the settlement pattern model is more performant than the elevation model. We used a null model as a, as a reference, so which is like a, a model without covariates. But the model 3, with the combination of the covariates from one model and the other, is more performant one than the other two. And model 4, that as you can see, retains distance from paths is even more performant. <coughs> to conclude, <laughs> I have two minutes. Uh, the, um, we now, I have, it's time to explain why I select, we selected the fourth, the, the additional covariate for model four, which is distance from paths. At the beginning, we added it into the model of uh, archaeological visibility, but colleagues and reviewers pointed out that uh, it's not necessarily so. So, okay, the, the paths can be like a constraint for a, uh, sorry, uh, we, we use them as a uh, proxy for a hunter gatherers mobility because uh, the, in the mountains, modern paths are similar to theoretical least cost paths, let's say. And so, and we can easily see that uh, there is a correlation, a directionality in the distribution of our sites. So they make us think that there was like a sort of um, relationship with the mobility. But we, colleagues and reviewers pointed out that it's not necessarily so. We're talking about modern paths. So the, the fact that a modern paths means miming that archaeologists are more likely to look for archaeological sites near the paths than farther <coughs> away from the paths. Therefore, we, we don't know if this proxy is a proxy for undergathers mobility strategy or for archaeologists mobility strategies. Conclusions. 
The proxies for, uh, so we assessed quantitatively that uh, the distribution of our, the Mesolithic site are only partially affected by the vis archaeological visibility and the surface and the uh, um, s uh, mobility strategy or the service strategies of archaeologists. Where, and on the other side, the settlement, the locational strategies of Mesolithic hunter gatherers seem to have like a stronger impact on the distribution of the sites we know nowadays. However, a model that combines these two, the covariates from the two models, and it adds distance from paths at additional covariates, is stronger than the two model, the, the two individual models. So this opens new issue, that opens some issues, which is like the data set contained by base camp and hunting stands, and these might have different locational strategies, so we have to discriminate them, but it's really difficult because, as I said, it's really difficult, they're really difficult to discriminate. And also the time variability. So we are, we are included, we put together for, to, to create like a, um, uh, a data set that was uh, uh, statistically reliable, uh, Kassin, uh, Kassinoviana and Soviet Union sites, but we should, we should analyze them separately because we cannot assume that they had similar strategy in two periods. But also, on top of the issues, we have some perspectives, and those perspectives are um, we, we need to, uh, to assess hunter gatherers' mobility using alternative uh, approaches that are more reliable than using modern paths, like for instance, least cost path simulation or agent-based modeling. And we need to model more accurately the Alpine landscape in the early Holocene because uh, replacing, like remodeling uh, re the insulation and replacing a coarse uh, uh, lithology uh, map with a more, uh, uh, with a higher resolution lithology map, change slightly but uh, significantly the results of the uh, of the of the model. So we need to have like better, more re reliable proxies for early Holocene and late Pleistocene landscapes of the Dolomites. And if you're interested in uh, our research there, these are the publications. Thank you very much.